Hello, good evening. Welcome to the conversation uh, with Alistair Philip Wiper. My name is Andrew Sanagar. I'm commissioning editor uh, for photography and design at Thames and Hudson. Had the pleasure of working with Alistair over the years on a number of different projects. And um, this conversation is titled on documenting forms of industry and forms part of the London Festival of Architecture. So before we kind of go into kind of the structure of what the talk is going to be about, kind of a few sort of bits of housekeeping that you'll be able to kind of get involved in, and the bits that you're seeing. First of all, there's a chat and a Q&A box that you'll be seeing on your side. So, you know, share your comments in the, in the chat, but the Q&A is an important thing. Um, so, you know, as you kind of have an idea, as you want a question that you're going to ask, please put it into the Q&A so that uh, our organizers can collate all of the questions. And here's the best bit is with your webcams on, you have the opportunity to appear live on this stream and ask the question yourself. Though if you feel terribly shy, we will collate the questions and ask them directly to Alistair. Um, the format is going to be a talk for around about sort of 30 to 35 minutes on a selection of photographs from Alistair's sort of career thus far. And then we're going to launch into the Q&A from there. So by way of an introduction, Alistair Philip Wiper captures the superhuman scale and eccentric nature of the processes, machinery and buildings involved in contemporary industrial production and scientific research. Shot around and inside global operational factories and labs, his immaculately composed photographs present a rigorous analysis of industrial forms and processes. Wiper has been commissioned by architecture and design magazines such as Blueprint, Wallpaper, Icon, Vice, Domus, Wired, The Telegraph and The Guardian, and he has produced several books, included, including Unintended Beauty, published by Hatchet Kants in 2020, and The Art of the Impossible, published by Thames and Hudson in 2020. And Alistair's work is currently on show at Forms of Industry, an RIBA exhibition that places Alistair's work alongside archival images by Eric de Mare, selected from the RIB collections. Separated by more than 50 years, the two photographers share a common interest in industrial buildings and landscapes, yet their differing approaches create a commentary on changing attitudes towards industrialization and sustainability. So formalities to one side, should we dive in and start looking at some photographs? We'll keep it very kind of loose and informal. We'll kind of look at images in turn. And as I said, as each of you has a, a question, please add it. So hello, Alistair, good to see you again. Hello, Andrew. Thanks for the introduction. Well, and hello kind of, everybody yeah. else. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the, the images that we're looking at here are, are, are beyond, in addition to, in some instances, the kind of the, the, the work which is in the exhibition. So I think as we go through, um, we can kind of flag which ones are in the show and which ones are in addition. But I think it's sort of worth talking about sort of origins of photographs, what attracts you to particular forms and shapes and structures, why the images came to be, et cetera. So, I mean, we'll start with this one, which I thought when we, you know, we were first talking about this sort of conversation, without that caption, the last thing I thought this was going to be is a vodka distillery. So <laughs> I'll, I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, so this is, I thought this was a good one to start with. This is this is one of the pictures from the exhibition, um, because from for me this embodies the kind of the contrast between the beautiful and the ugly, um, which I find interesting. I think that a lot of people that live around uh, this distillery probably think that it's quite ugly, and they're not very happy to have it in their back garden. Um, but I find something fascinating about it at the same time. And while I can see their point of view, I also see it as kind of like a, a sculpture um, or like a work of art in itself. Um, there's 99 million liters of vodka that get made uh, on this thing every year. That's a decent um, party. Yeah. And, it's uh it's it's just beautiful i think <laughs> what i'm intrigued by as well is one of the things you were saying is that you kind of immediately put yourself in the shoes of the people who have to live 
by this. You know, there have been many photographers who have kind of studied industrial objects and structures, etc. You know, Bernard Hiller Besher, for example, or you know, Mitch Epstein or Edward Patinsky, etc. And you know, the, the the images. I think you know what I find fascinating about your work is that it is both at the same time sort of architectural studies, but there are also these kind of concerns about what is this structure like in its immediate environment you know what is this going to be like to live with you know what's going on here and about the idea of kind of scale and production and the kind of the the way in which the world works i think so i also find it interesting you know we have this idea of the kind of the wonderfully kind of crafted kind of vodka yeah it's coming out of this kind of like extraordinary kind of industrial plant so i'm sort of interested as to sort of you know talking about your photography and how let's phrase this the right way, the sort of the, you're not looking necessarily for kind of all the answers, but you're sort of asking lots of questions rather than doing everything in the here it is, take it or leave it way. Yeah, I, I think I, I'm fascinated by the way that human beings uh, come together kind of like ants and build these ridiculously complex infrastructures that I can't even begin to understand how they work so I'm, I'm not an expert i kind of like taking the view of kind of a naive outsider that has a kind of childlike fascination with uh with these these places so my starting point is is kind of one of just awe of the human brain that we can we, we can build these things because it, it, I, I just get amazed when I, when i go to these places and i've been very lucky that that you know the architecture community and the design community have 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 like embraced my images uh and i think you know i i do have things to say in that respect you know i have opinions and i have uh i have things to say about the way you know this affects you know consumerism and the environment but my starting point is really wow how did you build that and aren't i lucky to be here photographing it <laughs> um <laughs> So, yeah, in terms of, you know, the people living around these kind of places, I'm also interested in this, this distinction between what is ugly and what is beautiful, because there's, there's a very fine line there, if you ask me. Um, I mean, I personally would, would maybe not like to have this in my backyard, but I have a picture <laughs> of it hanging on my wall here. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a matter of, you know, I think I go to these places and I try to see something which which sparks my imagination and try to find a kind of angle and I find the the thing about this place which which I'm which I'm fascinated with and makes my imagination run away and try to try to get that in a picture. And I think that's the kind of the intriguing thing is that you're finding the beauty in something which is utterly functional. It's that sort of the idea of, you know, sort of the the functional tradition, which is the you know, Damare is kind of like, you know, catch all kind of phrase um and the idea that whoever designed that distillery they're not sitting there thinking of the sort of the aesthetic considerations of this structure uh, or the exact kind of specification of the stainless steel that would photograph beautifully in the right light um but of course you as a photographer and your kind of innate curiosity about these things can find the can find the beauty in that structure let's move on to the next slide and kind of um, see what we kind of find onto the on the next one so complete contrast here. So tell me, tell me more about this, this one. This is actually the, right the picture you. I have hanging behind me here. Uh, this is the Adidas shoe factory in Indonesia, uh, where ten. I have, I have a I have my notes here with my facts, so I don't get anything wrong. Ten thousand people produce seventy five thousand pairs of shoes a day, and twenty two million pairs a year. Uh, and obviously not just in this building. This is one building out of kind of a whole complex. Um, and yeah, I, 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 this one isn't actually in the exhibition, but I included it because we, we're kind of, we're, we're talking about some subjects here, um, which are kind of consumerism and, uh, scale and waste and energy. And, and this image, uh, says a lot about consumerism and scale, I think. And I get a lot of reactions from this picture that people kind of see it for the first time and they they imagine i think they think sweatshop in uh, in asia 
and it's it gets an immediate negative connotation uh, despite the you know the 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 cool colors and the the bright orange hats and and everything like that i think people in the west are used to just seeing factories as kind of a a bad job we're not used to it anymore um so it it gets that immediate kind of uh, reaction and then I, i'm not a uh, I'm not an investigative reporter. I'm not going into these places trying to look at what's wrong with it and 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 everything like that. There, I think that's there's other photographers who do that really well. Uh, I'm trying to take a more neutral point of view and just show what it looks like. And and again, I'm fascinated by it, so I want to kind of try and translate that. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I yeah, I think what what's really intriguing with this one is that you know it people would sort of expect to see this in relation to kind of shoes, but then kind of very quickly leap into this idea of, well, you know, isn't this a terrible thing? Well, you know, that, that's kind of one of the great functions of photography is that you're not providing all of the answers. You're not seeking to document everything in kind of, you know, to the nth level of detail, but actually the sort of the, the image is the kind of the springboard to asking a whole set of questions yet you know at a glance the kind of the you know the factory looks clean it looks well lit it looks kind of well organized it looks safe etc um but that's all based on one single shot i mean i'm interested to know the conversations with adidas and getting the access and how you get into these places because you know lots of these kind of you know lots of these spaces and factories etc they're kind of you know very kind of well kind of policed so to speak in terms of who can gain access yeah, so I, I would say about half of my uh, projects, maybe a bit more kind of self-initiated, where I just have to do the legwork and try to get into into the places uh, myself and charm the right person, and that's that's an art in its in its in itself. Um, and then I also work commercially, uh, where I get hired to basically do exactly uh, the same thing, um, and I have kind of free artistic reign um and that basically just gets me access to places that i couldn't get access to access to on my own so i'm i'm also you know we can have a deeper conversation about the commercial versus art <laughs> kind of side of it but i i just i have kind of free creative reign and nobody told me i couldn't take this picture adidas told me you know they probably sent me to the nice factory rather than the the their worst factory um, but this was shot for a, a client uh, of mine called Red Associates that I did a project with uh, where I documented some of their clients and Adidas is one of their clients. So they managed to secure all the access to that. Um, yeah, that's how I got in there. So again, scale, sheer scale of things and the way things are made and what we don't typically don't get to see. Should we look at the next slide? Yeah. Slight contrast. This is yeah, this is uh, the Danish Crown Slaughterhouse in Denmark where they kill. Now I'm going to get my piece of paper up again where it says 100,000 pigs a week get slaughtered here. Um, and they've built the whole slaughterhouse in a way which uh, is accessible to viewers. So it's kind of like a viewing uh, walkway through the middle of the slaughterhouse where you see every step of the process. So they've tried to be as open as possible. Um, about showing the process and they have like 150 visitors a day or something like that and i've i've been vegetarian at one point in my life and i've kind of made my peace now with the fact that i eat meat and that an animal needs to die and that's again an, a, a, a bigger conversation but um i found that again i i, I didn't see anything wrong with the process if you're going to kill an animal and provide this much meat because the market wants it but my problem with it uh, again going back to the to the the shoe factory is do we need this many pairs of shoes and do we need this much bacon um it, it i've become very confused when i've been taking these photos and seeing these places about what is the right way to consume what is the right way to make a choice in the supermarket is this the right one or is this the right one and the story about which one is the right one is actually like extremely complicated. You have to be an expert in your field to know that this organic cotton 
uses less water than the non-organic cotton, et cetera, et cetera. So people are going around buying the thing that they think is the right thing, which might not be the right thing. And I don't have the answer to that. But the one thing I can see is we, are, we don't need that many pairs of shoes and we don't need that much bacon. <laughs> So it goes back to my point about the photographs provoking questions. I mean, I think what's intriguing here as well is that, you know, you have, you know, with the, with the vodka distillery, it's the kind of, in a way, it's hidden. It's not what they want to show you because they want, you know, absolute vodka would like you to believe that it comes out of some, you know, extraordinary crafts, you know, craft still in, in Sweden. And it's created by these kind of extraordinary kind of people concocting the, the various recipes, you know, whereas, you know, here, the kind of the opposite you know they actually want you to see it and they want you to understand and kind of open their doors which i thought was an ex you know, extraordinarily brave thing to do for a slaughterhouse because you know you know traditionally it's completely and utterly hidden from view so you know you, your photographs are sort of telling the sort of the stories of actually how mass market consumerism works either attempts by the kind of the the industry to show things like here or as is the case with the kind of the first two, the stuff you don't really ever get to see. But all of it, you know, provokes the kind of the, the audience, the viewer to ask questions, you know, even if they kind of don't have all of the facts in front of them, they can go away and find more. Should we have a look at the next slide? Yeah, sure. Yeah, Scale. this is another picture from the show. Uh, and this is uh, a mask. Tripoli container ship being built in South Korea. And this is being built in a shipyard where they build a uh, hundred vessels like this and oil rigs at the same time. So it's a huge place. And at the time this was being built, this was the largest container ship in the world. Uh, it's actually been overtaken now, I think. But this, now I'm gonna get my, my sheet of paper back. It holds 18,000 containers, which is the same as 864 million bananas. And in the <laughs> shipyard, uh, 46,000 people work. So it's like this kind of, I like to, if I can with my images, I want to give, I want to, I want to show what is happening. I'm not trying to lie uh, about what's happening, but I also want to get people's imaginations going. Uh, and this place you can actually see that there's a tiny little man up at the top and what they do is they it, it's like a kind of child's tv show that uh, i remember from my childhood or a kind of amalgamation of different ones where they come along with big cranes and these tiny little people lift up these huge segments of ships and put them take them on a boat on a crane to another place and lift it into another place and weld it all together and they just it keeps going and this is just utterly amazing and fascinating Again. i mean this is the, yeah yeah these are these are the kind of the in a way this is the sort of the the connection part of it in a way you know you've got the manufacture of the of you know the vodka and you've got the bacon and the pigs etc you've got the you know the the added ass shoes but the idea that those added ass shoes would find their way back you know into europe and the united states and other parts of the world on these vast sort of vessels and seeing them manufactured and sort of understanding, you know, this is, this is the globalized world. This is how mass market consumerism works, that it's creating these huge machines that can transport boxes of materials over vast distances. And again, it's sort of revealing that and telling that story, not kind of going to nth level of detail, but sort of making you consider just how these things work. Um, let's have a look at the next slide and see what we come on from there. Yeah, this is another picture from the show. Uh, and this is the Boeing Aircraft Factory, which is the largest building in the world. Uh, and this was photographed in 2017. So I've got a feeling it's a bit more empty now than it was. Uh, when I photographed it, I think Boeing has been to a pretty tough time. Yeah. Um, but again, yeah, the, the scale uh, of of these places, and the this, I think the building was built in the sixties uh, to build the the seven four seven, which they build very few of anymore. 
Um, but yeah, just looking at these, these are seven, seven, sevens, I think being built, which is a pretty big airplane. And, um, yeah, another relevant question is, you know, um, do we need to fly that much? Do we need that much bacon? Do we need those many shoes? And again, this is like, a, you know, I, I would say a lot of my work is creating kind of internal dilemmas for myself because I flew to the US to take this photo. I, you know, my, my livelihood is kind of flying around the world taking pictures. And I'm becoming more aware of that I've, my dream job, which I've worked a long time to get, is suddenly maybe not that uh, sustainable. So, yeah, interesting questions. But I'm, I, I would say there's a lot of my work is kind of creating more dilemmas for myself as well well uh, well yeah asking questions i mean i've always been interested as well in terms of process and you know how you know how long you spend in each site you know there are, there are images which we will see later on where they're kind of yeah they are kind of closer to your home so that's something you've seen and you see you can see that there's a there's a picture there but you know given the kind of the scale and the complexity of you know if if i were to set foot in this boeing factory over in washington state which you know is like the biggest square footage factory in the world and has been for decades i wouldn't know where to begin to take a photograph i wouldn't be able to kind of process it or understand it, or even something slightly smaller like the adidas factory again so i mean it'd be interesting to know you know a bit, a bit of your process how you research how you figure things out how you find your way into these vast complex systems and get a sense as a photographer with your kind of your your your, your mind and your eye open over what it is that you want to try and capture? What do you want to find? Yeah, sure. This is probably not the best example for that because I was actually, I was commissioned by Norwegian to go and photograph the building of their new 737 MAX, which is the, the plane which has had all the problems. And we <laughs> had about 10 minutes in the factory. So it's, I, it was the shortest, I, I mean, I was panicking, like just running around like a lunatic, trying to get everything that I could. And then we flew back <laughs> on a kind of a special, the first maiden, maiden voyage from Seattle to Oslo on a brand new 737 Max, the one that was like falling out of the skies. <laughs> we were like dr drinking champagne and oh, this is great. And then, yeah, a year later, we were pretty lucky to be alive. But uh, in my normal process is that I, 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 I try to look around me at what, uh, what I'm, consuming and the, the, the everyday objects that are around me. You know, I, I also, you know, I photograph sausage factories and, I, and, 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 and look at things which, and think, where did this come from? And I bet it's interesting in, the, in inside there. Uh, and another way is that I, I read the news every now and then and kind of, there comes a story about something which sparks my imagination or a new scientific kind of facility that's opened up and then I try to go there. And getting there and getting to the right person uh, is sometimes surprisingly easy and sometimes very, very difficult. I normally find that the, the person, when I, when I reach the right person, they either like the idea and understand what I want to do, or they just don't get it at all and are not interested. So I've mm. uh, there have been a few where I've kind of, battled for a long time to get into a place but in general that it usually goes quite quickly to be like a yes or a no the person the person on the other end gets it or they don't get it so what would be what would be an example in, in the kind of the slides that we've got of one where you actually had a long time on site so you had the chance to kind of find your way in and kind of get a sense of the space etc I would say almost all of them except this one, actually. <laughs> uh, so maybe we should go on to the next one. I can't remember what it is. Yeah, let's have a look uh, at the next let's, one. Let's have a look at the next one. Okay. Yeah, so this, Energy. for example, yeah. yeah, this was one of the first pictures that I took when I kind of embarked on this industrial, scientific, unintended beauty project. Uh, and I saw this, I saw a picture of this thing on, like, a, some kind of website that said like these are the 10 weirdest buildings in the world or something and i thought okay i have to go to this place and photograph it and 
I tried emailing them and, kind of, and, and nobody replied. And it was built in the 70s and it's kind of not sure who, who's working there. And it was in France and they have a lot of bureaucracy. So I just booked the plane ticket and, and went there and thought, well, I'm going to try and do whatever I can. And I ended up kind of speaking to the guy at reception and, and he said, yeah, you can do whatever you want. You can go in this in this field behind where they have, this, this is a solar furnace where from where I'm taking the picture, there's, um, there's a load of mirrors on kind of a, on a hill that follow the sun. And then they, they direct the sun's uh, energy onto this big mirror uh, that, that you're looking at, which is kind of curved and concentrates the, the energy onto one point about this size, which gets to three and a half thousand degrees. And they use it to test, um, uh, NASA uses it to test particle, uh, uh, materials for space re-entry. And I think they use it for testing materials that are gonna go in uh, nuclear power stations and stuff like that. Um, so I just kind of camped outside this place for, yeah, two nights, two days and two nights. And I think I had a bottle of pastis with me and just sat there watching the, the, the light change on the, on the, on the, uh, on the mirrors and, and had a nice time. And then when you've actually got your images done, you know, editing process, you like to try and whistle down to one. You're looking for one. Are there a sequence? Do you ever try and how do you know? We, we're looking at individual images here, which is kind of for the purposes of yeah. an exhibition of this talk. But then there will be I, others which go with this. Yeah, I have I have like I have two goals. My one goal is often I'm commissioned by magazines or by companies as well to to, to make a series of images, but when I go to a place that I think is interesting, I want to tell a story. So I want to come away. I, I, I do interviews with the people that work there, and I want to come away with a kind of a, a series of this place that tells a story of the place. And often those stories get get published on their own or get exhibited as a kind of a body of work in itself. But my I would say my main kind of long-term goal is that I want to find one picture from each place which can be part of my kind of larger body of work. Uh, and, and I'm looking for something which is which I can print really big and hang on a wall and will say just the right amount about this place, give just the right amount of information to kind of say, okay, I can maybe guess what this is, but uh, not enough to to stop you your imagination running away with, with, with yeah but what what is it and what is going on there and um and starting to yeah to, to think think a little bit more about it so yeah that all leads back to that sort of main point about the photography asking questions not providing every single piece of coverage so you just leave that little bit of mystery and each image is a springboard to further thoughts and further questions Should yeah as i said i like yeah yeah as I said, I like I like my role as a kind of naive observer, and I don't have the patience to become an expert in these things. Uh, so I'm, yeah, I uh, I think I want to ask questions rather than provide answers. Should we go to the next one? Yeah. Okay. More very hot things. Yeah. <laughs> This is um, this is a nuclear fusion experiment, um, which is actually being built in France. It's a it's a huge mega project, which is being funded by Russia, the US, the EU, Japan, uh, India, um, and it's it's the future of clean energy. Uh, and if I think it's more when it works rather than if it works, because theoretically nuclear fusion has been possible for a long time, but nobody's ever managed to build a machine that puts more, uh, gets more energy out of it than you put in. This is going to be the first one that does that. And it's huge. It's, I've also visited the place where they're building it in the south of France. This is in China, where they're building one of the, the coils. China is also part of, of it. So there's a lot of the whole world is kind of basically investing in this is going to be the future of, of clean energy in 50 or 80 or 100 years. Um, 
yeah, and this is just a tiny, tiny little part of the the tokamak, which is the the kind of the central part of the reactor, the core of the reactor. And then once it is completed, are you hoping to get in there? Is this one of your goals once it's actually yeah, finished? Yeah, I have a. I actually contacted them um, when it was still like a, a complete building site. Well, it's still a building site, but they hadn't even. They were, they were just diggers and dirt. Uh, and, and I've been there a couple of times since, and I'm kind of following the process as it goes along. So yeah, I have pretty good access there. I can kind of go when I want. And I'm, I'm just waiting for the point that's normally most interesting is when they start to, to put the big machines in and put all the wires in. Because there comes a point where it goes from being a building site, and then they, they close everything off. And then there's a kind of a magic point in the middle where they're, they're doing the really interesting, visually interesting stuff. Uh, and then they close it off forever. And no one can ever go inside this thing again. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm just waiting for that, that moment, which is going to be in the next couple of years. And then the factory here is just exclusively manufacturing these magnetic coils to go into the tokamak. No, is that they kind of... they, 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 it's a diesel factory, diesel engine factory for ships. And they, I think they went bankrupt a couple of years ago, and it was a it was a factory that happened to have the space to build this thing. And they're only building one, and it's this one here. I think there's another one, one being oh. built in Russia, a couple of being built in France, and there's going to be I think there's six or seven of them in total that make up the core, and they're all being built different places. And then they're getting this gets put on a ship to France, and uh, and then they install it in the machine. So if you imagine trying to how complicated it is to build a nuclear fusion reactor, the biggest one that's ever been built, uh, the future of energy, and then coordinate different countries with all the politics and all of the different languages that, and all the different ways of measuring things that are involved to micro millimeter scales and then ship them from another, from, from one different parts of the world and then slot them all together and get, expect them to fit together and turn it on. <laughs> And it's going to work. This is just—it just blows my mind. It's completely yeah. insane. Yeah. One thing is the hardware itself, uh, which is which is very very complicated, and another thing is just the infrastructure and organization that goes into achieving these things. And I feel the same thing when I go to a sausage factory, or I go to when I see the absolute vodka distillery, because I have such a, so, so little understanding of how these things work that I see that. You know, to build the, the vodka distillery, somebody had to design this thing. They had to get suppliers that that, that, that had designed different things and tailor-made things and come together and build it all. And that's that's very impressive to me. So a nuclear fusion reactor being built in different parts of the world that, that with countries that are you know borderline at war with each other mm. is just amazing. <laughs> yeah, so this, yeah. This one photograph, you, that's the springboard to this. You know, telling the story of this entire mega project, which in turn is a kind of a you know almost an extreme example of how the globalized world works. You know, components coming from different sources being assembled at different places, things being shipped over vast distances, and the sheer scale as well. That you know, the kind of the you know, it's it's actually quite difficult to kind of gauge the size of that thing relative to the kind of the crane in the factory so it is sort of playing tricks with you because there is no human in scale there are just a few things in the background which will give you a sense and you can't you're not even sure about how tall that fence is around it but it's yeah it's it's a very revealing photograph should we carry on to the next slide yeah let's go on okay much closer to home tell me about this yeah, one i think we have a couple up couple coming up though a bit close to home now uh, this is um this is a these are district heating water tanks and if you don't know what that means in copenhagen where i live uh, we have um power stations or waste incineration plants that that create hot water they get stored in tanks like this and then they get pumped out through the the city and every house has a um uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, not a transformer, a uh, uh, heat exchanger that then takes that hot water and, and heats the house with it. Um, which again 
seems very impressive to me. I could go on for quite a long time about sewage and uh, like you know <laughs> drinking water pipes and that I find amazing. <laughs> um, but and but again, this also just it to me it, it it's like a sculpture. Uh, it's purely practical. It was designed for purely practical purposes. There's there's probably not been a designer. I don't know. You guys, I might be you. Every the audience that's out there, feel free to correct me when I when I get things wrong um, because I'm probably getting some stuff wrong. But my in my imagination, there was an engineer that kind of came up with this solution and the look of the thing, and it looks like a sculpture. And in a way, it's sort of, it, I look at that and I sort of think of the work of like Bernard Hiller Bescher, you know, the idea, you know, the Dusseldorf school and this kind of finding yeah. beauty, kind of industrial, you know, the kind of the sculptural aspect of these extraordinary sort of domes. I mean, I, were, I first looked at them and I said, are these grain silos? And you corrected me and you told me what they, what they, are, what they are. And in a way, this kind of also then matches up with the, with the distillery at the beginning it's finding beauty in these kind of extremely functional designs you know the again the i'm sure there would have been some consideration over you know aesthetics at some point but fundamentally they just have to be the most efficient and functional structures they possibly can be and then the sort of the the heating for the water comes from where what's what's creating the heat these are right next to these are a huge power station the biggest power station in copenhagen uh, so I think they used to burn oil. They're moving from oil to, to like wood chips and hay, I think, mostly. Copenhagen's on, it's really on a, on a track to be, I think they want to be carbon neutral by 2025 or something like that. That's impressive. So they That's built, it. when they built the power station, they made it so that they could, they could uh, burn different things. Uh, yeah, they, they burn lots of different stuff over here. They burn anything. And then the next slide, I think we do actually go into, is it a waste incinerator, isn't it, is the next one? If we go to the next yeah, slide. Yeah, let's go to the next one. Here we go. Yeah, this is this is the newest um, waste incineration plant in Denmark, um, designed by Bjarke Ingels Group. And it has it's had quite a lot of press because it has um, a, a ski slope on top. So it's built in the shape of a hill uh, and the public can go up to the top and kind of have a look around and and yeah if you have a ski pass you can ski down it has the world's tallest climbing wall uh, on the outside and it it is insanely efficient and i think they i heard a story that they at some point in the last couple of years it's only two or three years old they ran out of trash to burn so they started importing trash from sweden uh because they needed stuff to burn uh and it gives off very few um you know dangerous uh fumes uh, and that kind of thing um yeah i love the fact that you kind of describe a building which has been sort of designed by one of the kind of the the, the famous sort of contemporary architects of, you know around that it's got a ski slope and a climbing wall and that you like to photograph the kind of the, 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 the pipe gallery and the kind of all of the ducting. Which yeah, I'm reveal... pretty sure Bjarke Ingels has had nothing to do with what I photographed. <laughs> but, you know, all respect to Bjarke Ingels and whatever, like I, I, there's loads of other people who photograph that. So I'm, yeah, I'm not exactly. that interested in photographing it. So my, my interest is getting in the inside and seeing the function. Of the what, yeah, yeah. Yeah, seeing what happened by accident, right? Uh, what what happened when the the engineers got let loose and decided to paint that to make this cable yellow and this pipe green and you know just completely randomly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think we've got one more slide, I think, to look at, and I think that completes yeah. our set. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Again, this this is a this is another uh, in a, yeah waste to energy power station where they where they burn they burn the trash that that um, that gets collected in Copenhagen. And this was built in the seventies. And I like that. 
I, I'm not sure if there's been a designer at some point uh, that because they're kind of 70s colors that that thought this is how it should look on the inside. But I like to imagine that it was an engineer that did it and just had the opportunity to pick any color he wanted and kind of and decided to to make it these colors. Uh, but when I was getting a tour of this place, they they told me that um, the UK has always been kind of the bad boy of Europe when it comes to to waste because we put everything in landfill. Um, and they say they say that now they've got so much more um, efficient at, at burning that landfill, that the stuff that's gone in there, that if they dig it up again, they're actually sitting on a lot of energy. So they're sitting on kind of a resource, which if they had just burnt it when they buried it 30 years ago, they wouldn't have got a lot out of it and they would have put a lot of uh, rubbish up into the atmosphere. And now if they dig it up, they can um, they can actually do something with it. So yeah, every cloud it's, has a silver lining. <laughs> it's matured. It's kind of increased in value in the ground. <laughs> Extraordinary. Yeah. Um, it's aged. So I think exactly, exactly. So I think that's sort of that's the last of our slides, and I can see that we've got a question. We've got somebody called Buck who's come all the way from Memphis. I assume Memphis, Tennessee. Um, so, um, so uh, if Chloe or Richard could bring him on, or we've got ready for questions. So, I um. So yeah, exactly. We take the slides away, and then we get Buck is here. Hello, guys. How are y'all? Hi, Buck. How's it going? Great, thanks. Good, thank you. Good. I fire um, away. What's that? Fire away. Ask your question. Yeah, it's uh, it's noon right now here. It's almost uh, noon. Uh, I just wanted to ask, you know, what are some of the challenges that you've faced, you know, in shooting these large industrial buildings? What I know you talked about access being an issue in some places, but it seemed like, you know, with some of your connections that you have, that wasn't always an issue. And then also, how do you stay focused once you do have that access and, you know, orient yourself for your goals within these large spaces? Yeah, sure. I, I yeah, I could probably answer both of those questions with the same kind of answer. I'm I'm really lucky. I feel really privileged to be where I am when I when I when I get there. Uh, so I have to kind of, in a way, the photography is like a, a secondary thing. I'm often being shown around, you know, like places like CERN in Switzerland, where the Large Hadron Collider is, by an engineer that is is building it, you know, and I, I'm very privileged. And I have to think, okay, I also need to take these pictures that I want to take. So uh, I'm, I, I sometimes see things in the in the spaces where I have a kind of, you know, 180 degree view with my eyes where I'm feeling and experiencing something which I want to capture. And my my lens, it, it, it can't capture what I want to capture. Mm -hmm. So I have to work pretty hard to kind of find an angle or a, a, like a, a different, like a, a just one bit of it, which is going to encapture those kind of emotions and those uh, those feelings that I that I want. Normally, it, it, it works. Uh, sometimes it doesn't work. And there have been places where I just haven't been able to kind of translate the feeling that I, that I want to translate. Um, but yeah, often, sometimes I walk in and I can just see the thing and I can just, it's obvious where to put the camera. And I just take it the shot and I know that I've got it. Sometimes mm -hmm. I have to work really hard for it. Sure. But it, it can also pay off as well because then you have to look deeper in a different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess a follow up to that question would be, what do you think your most successful shoot has been in your eyes? <laughs> that is a big question. Uh, I have, I mean, I think my most successful image has been the, the one of the, the, the container ship in South Korea. Mm. And that was one where I really knew um, when I, as soon as I saw it, I saw it from a distance and I was like, I need to be over there. And I got there, and it just it was just exactly where I needed to be. 
personally, I've always enjoyed going to, to CERN uh, because I, I feel very privileged when I get there. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also have an exhibition running at the moment, which I'm, I'm very happy with uh, in Copenhagen, which does, there's none of the pictures here, but it's, it's about um, uh, the sex industry in the US and how, um, how dildos and, and sex yeah. robots are made. And that was really fun and eye opening. Uh, so that would like, that was, a, and also I think fits very well with my, my over in general, like my, my other work. I like the, I like the kind of dirty, weird stuff as well as the straight functional stuff. Definitely. Well, yeah, congratulations on your show and your book. Thanks. And thank you for your time. Appreciate Thanks a lot. Thanks for the question. Thanks. Thank you. So we've got um, a couple of other questions as well, which have come into the kind of the, the little kind of chat feed here. Um, this is a question from Luke, who's a photographer and videographer from the UK, who's recently started in the industry, who asks, how have you adapted your process to photographing a wide variety of settings over time? You know, how have you kind of adapted to different environments, I guess, and kind of these different places? Mm. I think I've been pretty single-minded, actually, uh, in that I, I had kind of a light bulb moment when I decided I wanted to start doing this stuff because I wasn't particularly interested in science and industry before. Uh, and then I saw some work of some older photographers that were working in the 50s and 60s, and and, and I was like, that's what I want to do. That's going to be Which photographers out of interest? Which ones are the ones which kind of sparked uh, it? Maurice Broomfield and Wolfgang yeah. Sievers in particular. Mm -hmm. I kind of saw both of their work at about the same time and, and just right. thought, okay, this is, this is, this is what I'm going to do. So I, I was very kind of single minded in building up a portfolio and trying to get access and just going after the same thing. Um, so, I, I mean, I also do other work, which is like more interior and architectural work. Uh, but I would say in, in general, I'm, I'm, I don't feel like I am in a wide variety of different places because I'm, I'm, I'm I feel like I'm kind of going for the same thing uh, in a, in a niche again and again and yeah, again. Exactly. Uh, and, kind of... and hopefully growing through that, you know, like I would never want to just carry on doing what I'm doing. I'm always looking for a way that I can then try to twist it or tell a different story. Um, so yeah, ask me again in five years, I'll tell you. <laughs> okay, so th there you go, Luke. So yeah, five years time, do ask Alistair and see how it's gone. <laughs> and the second question I would say is, as, as a start, if Luke's starting up, find something that you're interested in. As a photographer, you can, you can ph photograph anything that you're interested in and you have a reason to go out and work. So just find something you're interested in and just go for that. I don't think too well, much about we, it. Yeah, when we were talking the other day and we started talking about the 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 vodka distillery and you were saying it's just that innate curiosity fascination with the thing which catches your yeah. eye and you just need to keep that with you that's the most yeah. important thing exactly. then the next question is from um emily who asks how much do you enjoy the solo aspect of your photography versus the collaboration between the subject slash location and client how much do you like being on your own, Alistair, with people leaving you alone? <laughs> Until last year, I quite liked it. And then Corona hit. And then I was on my own more than I wanted to be. Um, I like both, to be honest. I mean, I really enjoy going on a shoot with, like, with a team and an assistant and making something happen collaboratively. I mean, I, it's a really good, it can be really good fun on commercial shoots. Um, but I also love, getting on a plane on my own with just my camera and a tripod and and going to and, and yeah most of the, the the photos we just looked at i've just been on my own i haven't had a team with me or anything like that and uh and and i yeah i really enjoy traveling i i, I live for traveling and i i like and, and new experiences and food and i i'm pretty happy doing that on my own for a certain amount of time i can take up to a week a few days or to a week and then i get kind of right now i need to hang out with somebody else so <laughs> both yeah both i 
I, I really enjoy the that I'm I have the freedom to choose whether I, I want to work on my own or whether I want to be with other people. That okay. variation is good. Yeah, the best of both. I exactly. I couldn't just be on my own all the time. I would. That, I, I wouldn't think that was fun. Collaborating with other people, in some sense, is is rewarding on many levels. But equally, you can take that kind of that that risk, that punt. It's like the story you were telling about the solar furnace, where you just flew there and just thought, okay, I'm just going to go there and I'm going to wait and I'm going to get the photograph and I'm going to find my way in there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I think what one more question, um, which is from somebody called Everett who asks, your photos look very natural in terms of the colors. Is color a big part of your photographs? Um, they're asking that because they're looking at photography from a fine art point of view. So the kind of the colors in your work and the considerations over color, as opposed, I guess, to kind of like formal attributes and the, the structure and shapes, etc. It's very important for me, the color. I mean, the, I think the more, the more that I've been working uh, on over the last 10 years I've realized that the color is really really important so when I when I go to a place the, the first thing I'm looking for is kind of shapes and lines and graphical elements and then color and then trying to intertwine a story into that um, but I, I feel like yeah I, I just love color and I like bright color and vivid color and this industrial world can be a bit gray or brown sometimes and i don't like too much gray and brown in my pictures i need strong colors i need i need something that's gonna gonna stand out I mean, colors make me happy so i want color i want color around me all the time yeah yeah there's that there's <laughs> vibrancy in the in the images and the, and the work and you know that, i think that's kind of and I think that's part of the kind of the, the skill of your photography is that, you know, you, you, you're creating images which will kind of entice and seduce, draw you in. Then you can start asking those questions and color is an important part of that. They have to be, you know, pleasurable to look at, intriguing to look at, colorful to look at. Um, so I think that's kind of all the questions, unless I'm just looking down the kind of the, the chat list here. I think that's that's everything. So I think that kind of wraps everything up. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, don't forget, this is part of the London Festival of Architecture. There are some other events which are coming up. There's a photo workshop and other things. You'll see some slides in just a moment. Um, don't forget to try the networking function. I've been told that apparently it's like speed dating. So enjoy your kind of three minutes talking to each other. Um, and um, thank you again for joining us and uh, have a wonderful evening. Okay. Thank you very much and um, have a good weekend.